we've been of uh, extreme 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 uh, good support uh, and they put all the good energy that they could put even at distance so to make it happen today so first of all a huge thank and uh, and congratulations to uh, professor anastasiadis and georgina kaklamani uh, my second point uh, is that uh, well it's our first try at dtpn uh, for a full virtual event uh, i hope it will work perfectly fine uh, lots of people are already connected, which means that you did receive your credentials to join the different sessions. Uh, but it's a first try, so it won't be perfect, obviously. Uh, but uh, what's perfect anyway? So if a technical bug occurs, if you have a fixed screen, or if you cannot hear or, or, or listen anymore or see the screen, just be a, be a little bit patient. We have backup solutions. I have my dear colleague and uh, really helpful Alexandre Superville on my side with a different computer uh, during the whole meeting and we have solutions. So if you see that I suddenly disappear or the speakers disappear, uh, don't panic, just uh, start uh, two minutes after and normally it should, be, it should get back to normal. Uh, but it's fun, it's a first try. I, mean, I guess it's not the last try, not only because uh, the situation is not going very well and uh, the pandemics continue to, to, to grow and to spread worldwide, but also because we need new tools to communicate more often and we have a series of webinars of the ETPN coming from the working groups that will be announced in the coming weeks. So I'm super happy that we have this uh, great uh, occasion to test this virtual event for the ETPN. And I'm glad to, to test it with you live today. Um, another thing is that to avoid, uh, obviously to avoid to have too many problems, technical problems, and to ensure some kind of good uh, fluidity of the event, we make the choice. Uh, to have uh, lots of uh, pre-recorded session. So don't be afraid, all the speakers will be live. It's just that the lecture has uh, sometimes been uh, pre-recorded, so it's stable and you have good quality, but they will always be uh, here to answer uh, your questions. Talking about your questions, uh, I guess you're all extremely familiar with the Zoom tool, even for webinar. Um, you have at, in the bottom menu an option for Q&A, where you can, uh, you, you, can, you can interact with us in several ways. First, you can uh, raise your hand anytime so that we can see that you have a question to ask. And when the Q&A session is coming, I can give you uh, the, the virtual mic and you can uh, ask it live and the panelists will be uh, able to answer. But you can also write your question down if you are too shy. Uh, and uh, we can moderate the questions and, uh, and, and answer live uh, during the Q&A session. So don't hesitate to ask question anytime, but we will regroup the question after each talk or after each group of talks, depending on the session. Uh, I will ask all the speakers to be very strict with the time, with the time that they have uh, uh, dedicated for their talk. They already know that. I sent plenty of emails in that sense. Thank you in advance. Uh, now I would like to have one minute uh, to show you uh, the program at a glance. So. Yes. So I guess you all see now uh, this uh, screen. Uh, just an overview. So today, obviously, is day one. We will start by the opening session uh, in two minutes. Uh, this session is shared by our chairperson of the Expo of the ETPN, Ho Schmidt, indeed, and uh, Spiros Anastasiadis, which is the president, who is the president of Fourth ISL, our co-host and co-organizer today. Uh, it will last just before uh, 11 and then we'll have a short break until 11. At uh, 11, we'll have the first uh, keynote of uh, today. Uh, we are extremely lucky because we have uh, Patrick Bamauf uh, from CureVac in Germany. You all know CureVac now, indeed. Uh, and uh, so Patrick will give us a, a great keynote lecture about uh, mRNA vaccines and more generally some information about the vaccination program and uh, COVID-19 at CureVac. So we are extremely excited to listen to Patrick and to be able to uh, interact with him. Then we will have a lunch break uh, from noon to 1.30. Then we will have the ETPN working group meetings. It's for ETPN members only. I guess you all received the invitation from the different working group leaders for which you have expressed an interest to participate. You can go from one meeting to another. Uh, I wish you very successful uh, group meetings. 
And uh, these interactions are extremely helpful for us because uh, we want to make the ETPN a useful place for you, not just a place to have a meeting once a year, a communication. We have lots of action coming up. And uh, well, that, that's a very important part of the, of the meeting for us. And I thank the, very much by advance all the efforts from the working group leaders from the expo of the ETPN because they've worked hard to prepare some very nice meetings for you. Then Alex, we will... sorry to interrupt you, but we can't see your screen. Okay. Um, no big deal. Can you see me? Can you yes, see we can see you. Yeah, okay. But not, but not your screen. Not my screen. No. Uh, and, uh, and now? Now we can see it. Thank you. you. You can see the slide, right? Yes. Okay, so I will keep it like that to avoid any risk. Uh, so I will, I will, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ruth. So after the uh, working group meeting, we'll have a short break. So it will be around uh, 3.30. Uh, well, a decent break because we have a 30-minute break. So you can do your tons of emails <laughs> and drink some coffee. And then we will uh, start again the session at 4 with the first Pitch Me Up session. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the TPN event know very well this session. If these are selected abstracts uh, for translational projects in nanomedicine that have been carefully selected by our committee. We received a lot of abstract and you will see, uh, I hope that you will like the one that we have selected for you. So five of them today for the first one. So very, very short talks. And finally, we will finish the day with a second keynote uh, from um, Maria Jesus Vicente uh, from Polymer Th Therapeutics Lab. And uh, she will give also a very nice keynote as you will see. Uh, finally, after this second keynote, we have a social event. What is a social event during a virtual meeting, you, you, can, you can say? Uh, well, you will see. We, we, tr we try to, to come with some kind of uh, fun way to interact with each other. You will be uh, random separated in very small rooms and it will be, you, you will go to several rooms during, the, during the, um, the hour. So prepare whatever you like to drink. It can be water, it can be whatever with alcohol inside, being very cautious with that. But you will see it will be a fun time from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. if you'd like to stay. Uh, finally, an occasion just to, to chit chat and to, to, uh, to network with uh, our colleagues and attendees from ETPN 2020. So I look forward also to this session. Uh, so that was almost it. Just to let you know that you can go anytime to the website of ETPN 2020, which is uh, www.etpn2020.eu. And you can uh, see all the details of all the sessions uh, with the name of the speakers. You, you have also their profile in the speaker page. Uh, you can uh, contact them through LinkedIn notably. So don't hesitate to go and contact the speakers if you liked their presentation. And if you want more details about the timing of the session. Uh, please, if you tweet, don't forget to use the hashtag ETPN2020. That's very important for us to raise some uh, attention around the event. I thank you in advance for that. And, uh, and that's it. That's, on, that's it on my side. I'm uh, extremely excited now that we can start the session. And uh, you won't be surprised that uh, to start, I would like to give uh, the room and the mic to Professor Anastasiadis from uh, Force ISL. Uh, and he will uh, share some uh, welcome talk and also some uh, very good news about the activity of Force ISL, which is, as you know, a very important research institute in Greece. So, Professor Anastasis, dear Spiros, it's my great pleasure now to leave you the floor. Alex, thank you very much. Uh, it's it really uh, all your hard work that made this uh, uh, meeting uh, happen. Uh, so, what I would like to do is, is um, just welcome the, 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 the people So can you see my screen? Perfectly, you can go in presentation mode now. Fantastic. So it's, uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this 15th edition of the annual event of the Nanomedicine uh, ETPN. And uh, it's, it's, we all know, and this is why we're here, that the application of nanotechnology in diagnostics, imaging, therapeutics, and regenerative medicine opens new avenues in research that can significantly impact human health. 
And so the objectives of, of this event, of this meeting is, is to provide a forum where the participants will be able to discuss the science and catalyze innovation in the nanomedical technology, to identify future challenges in research and to provide a virtual environment. Unfortunately, now we have to use this word virtual there for the interaction and collaboration among the members of the nanomedicine community. Uh, we expect that uh, all of us will be able to have to, to analyze most recent advances in diagnostics, therapeutics, and regenerative medicine. Uh, we would have loved to host you all in Heraklion, but at least we're happy to see you all uh, virtually. And uh, just, just I, I, on purpose, I got out the screen. This is an image of, of our previous meeting in, uh, in, uh, with a lot of people in a nice hotel in 2016. This is what we'll not be able to, to provide. That is a nice dinner with some nice uh, dancing and um, uh, led by, by the chair of, of EGPN at that, at that time. So uh, what I would, I'm, I'm coming back to, to, to this presentation and I'll take like 10 minutes or so to, to tell you some things about, about our research institution. Uh, you, probably you, you, you see that this is a, you know, a weird title, Institute of Electronic Structure and Laser, but essentially we're an institute of uh, light and matter. I, I'm the director of this institute and, and also professor of chemistry. So this Foundation for Research and Technology, it's a research center that is located outside Athens with uh, five institutes here in Iraqi on Crete, Applied and Computational Mathematics, Electronic Structure and Laser, Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, Computer Science and, and Astrophysics. And of course we have the Science and Technology Park. And then we have a small institute in Rethimon, this is the next by Institute of Mediterranean Studies, an Institute of Chemical Engineering Sciences in Patras, Institute of Biomedical Research, which is now a branch actually of the Molecular Biology Institute in Ioannina, and most recently Institute of Petroleum Research in Hania. And we also run a, a technology transfer office all, all, over, all over Greece. Uh, in, in Crete, I mean, probably some of you know the place for vacation, but let me tell you that there is a, a, a large number of institutions. The University of Crete is both in Heraklion and Rethymnon, uh, with the University Hospital here in Heraklion. We have fourth, we have the Institute of Marine Biology, the Technical University of Crete in Hania, and small, two small agricultural research institutes. So it's a, it's a high, there is a high concentration of research and, and educational activities in, in Crete. Behind me actually is, uh, is the building of, of uh, our uh, research center, where you can see also that we have some snow up in the mountains for the uh, people from Northern Europe. Uh, so the, the, the research center, the total, uh, has about 1,400 people, 100 researchers, uh, 150 collaborating faculty members from the uh, universities, uh, a large number of, of fellowships and specialist uh, technicians, and among these people, only uh, 330 are, are permanent staff. The, the rest of the people run on, on contracts from competitive projects. So our institute, as I said, is light and matter. So we have a, a large division on, on laser interactions and photonics uh, that go from basic science and strong field, field physics to dynamic processes to theory and a, a, a large activity on what we call photon science applications, uh, photonics and, and, uh, and uh, bioimaging. This is here laser processing of materials, photonic materials, diagnostic methods, cultural heritage science uh, and photonics for agro-food environment. And then we have another uh, large division on material sciences and devices from microelectronics to soft matter, polymers, uh, hybrid nanostructures, magnetic materials uh, and um, me metamaterials and theory. Uh, and, and finally, we had an activity on, on astrophysics that actually now, as I mentioned already, became an independent institute of, of astrophysics. So we essentially address almost all the, the key enabling technologies of the, of the European Union. Uh, the size of the vector uh, means that on biotechnology, for example, I made it smaller because we have the independent institute of, of uh, biology and biotechnology. 
During the last evaluation of the institutes in, in 2014, our institute was evaluated by this 11 member committee and we had received the highest mark 5.0 in all the, the, the uh, items that were evaluated, uh, all the categories, and we were number one among all the institutes in, in the country, as you can see in this combined uh, table right there. So our, uh, one, something that characterizes the Institute is the participation to what is called the European Research Infrastructure Program. We are part of the Laser Lab Europe since 1990. That was renewed actually last year uh, on the Hyperion CH on cultural heritage, which was also renewed. Uh, another uh, on cultural heritage on, on e-research together with the uh, Institute of uh, Computer Science. Uh, the USME on soft matter, the NFFA Europe on nanosciences, the ACTFAS for photonics innovations. And we are also part in, in two activities within the S3, the European Strategy Forum of, on uh, research infrastructures, the extreme light infrastructure, and the IRIS again for heritage science. So when we, what we mean by, by this research infrastructure, I give you an example. This is uh, for Laser Lab Europe, that is a consortium of many laboratories in, uh, in, in Europe. And over this period, 1990 to 2019, we have provided more than 3,500 days of access to people all over Europe to come and do experiments uh, here in, in, uh, in, in, in Crete. 309 projects, 500 researchers from European research centers. <clears throat> Actually, this is this is the bulletin of the of this uh, uh, cultural heritage. You can see in one of the most recent ones in July, the cover is from our activities on utilizing uh, <coughs> lasers, actually non-linear microscopy, uh, to detect cal uh, cancerous uh, cells. Uh, we have received uh, researchers from our institute uh, have received uh, uh, major awards from like American Physical Society, Russian Optical Society. These are the recent ones after 2013, the European Society of Rheology, the Society of Rheology, the US Society of Rheology, and we're very proud. Uh, actually, uh, we uh, have also researchers of our institute uh, being, uh, uh, having a society distinctions, like we had at some point the president of the European Material Research Society, the, Euro the president of the European Polymer Federation, and the president of the European Society of Molecular Imaging, and we missed by a little the, the presidency of the, of the Division of Polymer Science of the American uh, uh, Physical Society. Uh, I will show you one thing that uh, is not related to our meeting, but I think you will like it, is our efforts to essentially utilizing lasers to, to clean the marbles of, of Acropolis and, and uh, the Parthenon and also the Cariades. And we have received an award by the National Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works in, in, in that. This is when, when our system was, was at the, Acropolis, the New Acropolis Museum. Uh, I have to... Oh, come on. Okay now, okay, now now it works. So you can see here, uh, it, it, uh, it was a, a laser system that was developed by, by the Institute where it utilizes two different uh, wave vector, wave, wavelengths that can clean the organic deposits from, from the marbles of Acropolis because of the pollution actually, without affecting really what is called the patina, you know, the color behind, and, and also the, the, the marble uh, it, itself. You can understand that, that we had to prove that we don't make any damage to the marble before we were able to, to really uh, work on, on the monument. So very quickly then I want to, to show you three, four more transparencies on our activities in the general area of, uh, area of, uh, of this conference. For example, we have strong, strong activities on bioimaging and, and biosensing, utilizing uh, optical and as well as photoacoustic imaging, imaging techniques. Also, as, as I mentioned uh, before, nonlinear microscopy, second harmonic generation, third harmonic generation, and, and um, on for detection of, uh, of cancerous cells. 
uh, this is uh, the, the, the front cover that I showed you a moment ago. Other areas on, on, on biomaterials, uh, functional amyloid materials and, and, and their structures and their self-assembly uh, behavior. Uh, also uh, computer uh, simulation work in this, in this area. Biomaterials for tissue engineering, uh, where actually we develop also the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the devices, the, the, the material uh, that, that um, can be used for the tissue engineering. <clears throat> Uh, and as well as in the area of regenerative medicine and in your in your engineering. Uh, if you have, if you were here, you, uh, then you would have the opportunity to see uh, some more on, on, on our efforts in this in this area. Just to tell you that for some of these uh, structures, we utilize uh, laser uh, fabrication uh, techniques, either uh, on on solid surfaces and and creating. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this uh, three-dimensional uh, structures or using non-linear uh, lithography to essentially polymerize the material and develop uh, such, such structure. Moreover, uh, we have been involved with, with uh, uh, drug delivery uh, based on, on smart systems, systems that, for example, can, can utilize light or other, or other stimulus to stimuli to, to, to open up structures in order, in order to deliver uh, what, is, what is there, uh, or, or using uh, magnetic nanocrystals uh, for uh, MRI uh, contrast uh, agents or uh, therapeutics as well. And also in many areas in, in uh, uh, biomedical devices, uh, the properties of surfaces are very important and so we can we have also activities on super hydrophobic, super hydrophilic, or reversible uh, surfaces that can be utilized in, in many of these, of these things. So uh, I will stop here. I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, welcome to the, to, to virtually welcome to Heraklion. And um, we're all looking forward to, to a very nice event where, where we will be able to, to listen to all the new developments in, in, in the area. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. I think I stopped my, my screen, correct? Yes, you don't share anymore. We just can no. see you, which is a great pleasure, Spiros. Um, so unfortunately, you could not see my screen at the beginning with the program, and we could not see your screen when you were sharing the pictures. But first of all, it's in our hearts and our memories. And second, I have some secret videos of some of you dancing in Heraklion that I will use when I will leave ETPN someday, like secret, secret files, but these are excellent. Oh, now we can see them. Fantastic. Oh yes. Patrick and Anil dancing. I won't forget that for my whole life. Yes. <laughs> that was fantastic. And more seriously, uh, I mean, uh, if you want to have a great career in a very sunny place with extremely friendly people and incredible uh, equipment, uh, please consider to visit Force ISL, and uh, this is a crazy place to work. This is fantastic. And Alex, we we take a rain check for a for a future event uh, in uh, I know in, that. in Akio. I know that. Thanks again, Spiros. That was a very nice introduction, uh, very broad, and we can see the, I mean, the all the the influence and the impact of the of the institutes. Congratulations for your international impact. Uh, now I'll, I will leave the floor to Ruth Schmidt, our dear uh, chair of the uh, Expo of the ETPN. And Ruth will share some very important messages regarding ETPN and nanomedicine now and in the future. So Ruth, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, all my nanomedicine friends. I hope you can hear me. And yes. I hope you can see my screen. Absolutely. And now it's full screen. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah. Now I try also to... Um, prepare my pointer in case I need it. Uh, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of ETPN, of which I am the chair at the moment, to this virtual um, annual meeting, which should have been in Heraklion. At least I put myself virtually in Heraklion so I can forget the six degrees and rain outside here. 
uh, I would um, also like to thank the people from FORCE and especially also uh, Alexander uh, for putting this together. When we planned to have this year's annual event, we couldn't in our dreams imagine which journey a small little bug um, would, put, uh, would send us on. I mean, this was really a hard work. We started with uh, the idea to have the meeting in Heraklion in June. Then we tried again with the date in September. Then we went on to October. And here we are in October, but not in Heraklion, but in the virtual event. It's a pity, but it's the case it is for almost all events at the moment, so we have to do our best for it. First, I have to tell you that normally our annual event is at the same time as the General Assembly, but uh, this year, according to our legal statutes and French law, we had to have our um, annual assembly um, performed by the end of June, so we had to do all the um, General Assembly uh, votings electronically this year. So the way we did it was we had, um, we put all the documents on our intranet for the members. Then we had a webinar for the members where we presented the activity report and we also presented the accounts for 2019, the budget for 2020. And um, the members had the, the option to ask questions. And then we had an open e-voting from 22nd of June to the 6th of July for the approval of the accounts, the budget for 2020 and the membership fees for 2021, which stayed, by the way, uh, unchanged. And as you can see, uh, all these votes were approved. The members can find all the official documents uh, on uh, the internet of the website, if you have any, uh, if you want to to go back and look at anything. But now I would like to take us a little bit back uh, to the last year, from last summer when uh, we started, uh, when I started as a chair, until now. I would like to remember the very very successful and nice meeting that we had in Braga, the Nanomed Europe meeting. It was a different meeting from this year's event because it was a combined meeting between um, the Nanomed Europe, a scientific conference and the ETP annual event. Just to remind you who is the board of ETPN at the moment. You have me as the chairperson, then we have two vice chairs, Agnes Potier and Raymond Skiffelers. Kathleen Spring is the secretary, Philippe Moberna is the treasurer, and then we have the working group leaders, Mathieu Germain, Lorena Diegas, uh, Marcia Bedoni, Fanny Caputo, Luis Sousa, and Jack Barocas. You see everybody except for Philippe on this slide. Also, all working groups have one to two vice chairs. A few facts and figures from last year's conference. It was the 14th, can I remove that? No. Um, it was the 14th annual event of ETPN and it was merged with the third European Nanomedicine Scientific Conference. It was co-organized with INL in Portugal. It had about 300 attendees from 20 different countries. Uh, and the, the survey showed that people globally were very satisfied with this event. There were 13 sessions, many more than this time because it was a combined scientific uh, conference and the annual event. And there were 70 speakers a lot of short talks selected from abstracts, keynotes, and we also had the best poster and best short talk award. This was the event 
that um, ETPN organized during the last year. But ETPN was also represented at important co-design events of the European Commission, where we try to give our input and to be visible as the nanomedicine, as, as representatives of the nanomedicine community. So we attended the European Research and Innovation Days, both last year and this year. And we also uh, participated at the EU Health Programme High-Level Conference last uh, fall. I think it is important that um, when we go back to this little bug, it is, um, the bug is a problem, but I learned there are no problems. They are challenges. So the bug is a challenge. But I also learned that there are no challenges, there are opportunities. And I think for the nanomedicine community, it is important to see the opportunities we have to contribute and to show that nanomedicine can be an enabler to fight COVID-19. I just, um, uh, um, just listed a few areas where nanomedicine can make a difference. If we look at vaccines, mRNA and DNA vaccines, they are based on lipid nanoparticles. And we will um, so, uh, later on have um, an interesting uh, keynote uh, from Patrick Baumhoff on this. Nanoparticles can also be, be used to mimic the virus. Then, uh, Nanomedicine can contribute to therapies that target the life cycle of the virus or that support the immune system to fight it. We can deliver monoclonal antibodies. We can deliver repurposed drugs which have severe side effects to lower the side effects. Uh, nanomedicine can also contribute to therapeutics to reduce the anti-inflammatory response and to inhibit cytokine release and syndrome. For example, the liposomal dexamethasone that is developed for, an, for other clinical indications may now be repurposed um, to fight COVID. And then the other area, nanotechnology-based diagnostic tools. Many groups and many of you probably that attend work on new diagnostic tools uh, using nanotechnology, um, gold nanoparticles, quantum dots, magnetic nanoparticles. These are very important um, contributions. And another important um, um, area is targeting nanocarriers. We can help to target the lung, to target the nasal mucosa, or to target specific um, COVID receptors. Another topic that I would like to um, talk a little bit about is, we know that we have a changing uh, scientific and funding environment in Europe. And of course, we will have a post-COVID-19 time. So, where is the place of um, ETPN and nanomedicine in this new um, environment? Last year in Braga, we presented uh, our vision. We want to address unmet healthcare needs with innovative nanotechnology-based solutions for the benefit of the patients. And we also had some important goals we want to be the ambassador and the think tank for the nanomedicine field and the community. We want to, um, we want to um, uh, contribute to sustainability, both for the funding for the nanomedicine area, for the nanomedicine industry, and also, of course, for ETPN itself. And that part is still very important. Uh, ETPN needs to secure funding from membership fees. So all of you that are non-members now and listening to me, if you want to be a member, go to our website or send an email and take contact um, if you are interested in becoming a member. When we looked at these, um, when I looked back at these goals again, <coughs> um, 
some main challenges could be un identified. If we look at the support for industrial development of nanomedicines, there is a challenge. The sustainability of our translational hub is in danger because UNCL funding ended last year. The funding of the pilot lines last, uh, ended last year and the funding for the health tech tab will end this year. And only one OETB for nanopharmaceutical production got funded. We don't know why. They uh, always talked about they would uh, fund two. They only funded um, one. If any of you uh, has more information on what are the, what is the, uh, the reasoning behind from the commission, then please send me an email and explain to me. I would be very interested in knowing. Another challenge to maintain the funding for um, R&D and I and for um, academia is that we still need this funding, but the funding um, environment is changing. And I will get back to uh, all those um, challenges in a, uh, in a minute. Then there is another threat. We have had um, a negative growing perception for the nanomedicine field the last year. We had some clinical failures for example, bind, but on the other side, we have positive clinical translations um, that wouldn't have been possible without nanomedicine. Also, the US National Cancer Institute halted its funding for the Centers of Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence. And there is an, a really negative editorial in Journal of Control release by Keenan Park, which was widely commented ever since. So, what are possible actions or actions we have done? First, to the transla uh, translational hub. You can see the translational hub, the, all the instruments that um, uh, will help to bring ideas to the clinic and to the market. What, um, what we have tried, uh, um, ETPN, was asked to be partner in one of the proposals for the OETB for nanopharmaceuticals production. And in this, um, pro, uh, in this OETB, we would have been uh, responsible for the dissemination and the stakeholder engagement, very important parts and parts that uh, an association like ETPN can contribute a lot with. But unfortunately, this was not the one that was funded. Uh, through the Nobel project, um, where ETPN is a coordinator, we are working very hardly now on find, finding sustainable solutions for the health tech tab so that this one can co uh, continue after um, end of this year. And outside of ETPN, um, I know that the EUNCL partners, they work on a for fee service model so that the service that the EUNCL provided will not disappear, but of course, without funding, it has to be a for fee service. When looking at the perception of the nanomedicine field and grow, uh, it growing and more negatively, the working group uh, of nanopharmaceutics um, wrote a, a publication and you will hear more of that later on by Matthew. So I, I won't say more than that I was very pleased to see that this publication uh, in the Journal of Control Release was the top tweet article of July, in fact, and also that uh, it is the cover on the October issue, the front cover. So most of my time, uh, time I would like to um, use to show you uh, and explain a little bit about the new envi environment, Horizon Europe, because there is a very uh, critical um, change from Horizon 2020, where we had these pillars and these programs and going to Horizon Europe. As you can see, the program, the, the leadership program, for enabling and industrial technologies 
where we had an influence, where we could um, um, contribute to calls, suggest calls for uh, nanomedicine uh, together with other e um, ETOs and ET, uh, ETPs that could, um, uh, photonics could suggest calls, everybody could suggest technological calls there. This is gone. There is no technology focused program anymore in, uh, in Horizon Europe. So we need to think differently. We need to find out how can we influence now because there is not a program where we really can contribute to calls specifically uh, for technology development. But we still need the funding. So um, what have we done up to now? We have participated in several surveys, both for the Strategic Plan of Horizon Europe and for uh, several other topics that um, the European Commission asked the public uh, and all organizations to contribute to. We have also participated in a survey for the upcoming um, partnership in health. Uh, we have contributed to Mission Cancer and Europe's Beating Cancer Plans. And as I said, we have participated in the co-design sessions of the European uh, Research and Innovation Days. But the, the big challenge is the lack of any NMBP similar program. So we need to think differently. And uh, you will uh, afterwards um, hear about the Health Tech Alliance by Klaus Michael Weltring, which is part of the new of the possible new thinking. The involvement on the work program and call design is not happening via technology platforms and technology organizations anymore. It's happening via member states and those have national reference groups, the ministries, the funding agencies, the NCPs. Uh, so we, we haven't received any program drafts to the ETPN. Uh, I know that some of you and also I have seen some of the drafts, but they are coming from our NCPs, they are um, confidential, so it's not possible to share those with you. But what we can do for you, we can help you in understanding the new types of calls. And most of all, uh, we can create different types of meeting places for networking. And not only networking in ETPN and in nanomedicine, but across the various ETPs. Because as Klaus will explain to you, we have a very good uh, network among the, the key enabling technologies that are important for health. We will have the webinars that Alexander mentioned on various topics, and we will have our website with a knowledge hub the uh, working group forums. And uh, now I can't say, um, and also we can influence uh, the future programs of partnerships to include CrossCAT in their calls, especially I'm thinking of the, uh, the former Aeronets like Euro Nanomed. Um, I will be in a workshop where they discuss their future and I will of course, um, try to influence them that cross-cat components in their calls is very important. Just to um, show you a little bit how the Horizon Europe pro, uh, program came together. It started in the first place with a legal base that formed the pillars, the intervention areas. Then there was the the, um, the time of strategic pro programming on program level, the strategic plan. In this case, there were a lot of surveys where we could um, contribute to different topics. They were quite high level and not very specific. Sometimes you had to choose between food for everybody, good climate for everybody and good health for everybody. What do you want most? I mean, we want everything. So it was, it was not uh, an easy process. 
but the result were expected impacts. And those expected impacts are now in the work pro program reflected by so-called destinations. And these desti destinations then lead to topics and expected outcomes. And I just want to give you an example from a work um, program draft, just picked out the cluster health. The cluster health has six destinations and those can't be confidential because they have been presented at the research and innovation days. But as you see, uh, these des destinations are very uh, clinically and very um, um, high level topics like staying healthy in a rapidly changing society or tackling diseases and reducing disease burden. But there are at least two that are quite interesting for us, unlocking the full potential of new tools, technologies and digital solutions for a health society and maintaining an innovative, sustainable and globally competitive health related industry. And if we look at some of the topics that are um, selected, then in these two areas, we have, for example, a topic, smart medical devices or the next generation advanced therapies. And in, in the topic of the industry, we have green pharmaceuticals uh, as, as an interesting uh, topic. And for example, the outcomes in green pharmaceuticals, um, what is uh, expected as an outcome is that we have greener manufacturing processes for pharmaceuticals, and that we have sustainable and competitive manufacturing processes for pharmaceuticals. So I hope that I um, could show you a little bit that the, the work program looks quite different. The word technologies is only um, very sheldon shown. And when it is shown, it's always shown uh, as a combined technology, not a specific technology, not nanotechnology or biotechnology, but it's always just technologies. And this is um, what is the important thing, I think now. Uh, we have to change our thinking from co-designing uh, calls to co-design a cross-cat innovation ecosystem. We want to um, make the health tech revolution happen for patients. And we want that the patients can benefit fast from the best innovations from the key enabling technologies for health. At the same time, we have to ensure sustainability of the healthcare system. Because as you know, patients don't care about technology, they care about quality of life. So the key enabling and digital technologies together they will transform the continuum of care. It will be more preventive, more efficient, and more personalized. And we need to bring together all the key enabling technologies in the health area into an innovation-friendly ecosystem. And this is our, um, here we have our possibility to really help to co-design this, even as uh, Klaus will tell you, to take the lead to uh, make this happen. And then we can contribute widely to cluster health, to the mission cancer, to the PPs, uh, PPPs and everything. Because ETPN already alone is a unique ecosystem. We have uh, multiple stakeholders, we are multidisciplinary, uh, and we have um, collaborations with, uh, in several areas with others. Also, if you look at the new a partnership that is coming, the Innovative Health Initiative. This is uh, a partnership with um, synergy between different types of industries in the health tech and healthcare area, pharma, biotech, uh, medtech. And by building this um, cross-cat alliance, we can mirror the industrial alliance and contribute in this way. 
as I said, um, this, uh, I think this picture you will see once more later on, but it shows that uh, disruptive technologies together will revolutionize the healthcare. And this means science driven revolution and technological driven revolution has to work hand in hand. Uh, starting from new biomarkers, nanomedicines, and going all the way to, smart, uh, uh, to smartphones and apps. Just to show you um, a little bit in a different way what I mean, that uh, cats uh, has to be, have to be used in synergy, biotechnology, microfluidics, biomaterials, nanotechnology, photonics, digital, digital cats, all they together will contribute to R&D evolution. And they need to go together because uh, the change from small synthetic drugs to biologics and beyond is not possible if we don't have uh, nanopharmaceuticals that, uh, or nanotechnology delivery platforms that help them to reach their targets inside the cells, for example. But um, producing nanopharmaceuticals is not easy without smart productions. So all those, um, and um, we can't um, make targeting nanopharmaceuticals without understanding the disease biology and without having biomarkers. So all those um, uh, technologies, they have to be used in synergy and then together, we can, in a cross-cut approach, address the unmet healthcare needs with innovative nanotechnology-based solutions for the benefit of the patients. So I hope I have given you an idea of the new environment and um, how we should change our thinking and our actions from um, technology push, technology-based input to a cross-cat environment that can solve solutions in a technology pull way. And by this, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Ruth, very much for this uh, very broad uh, and very pedagogical uh, lecture that was that was really interesting even on my side and even if I know uh, that that was great so um, uh, well you touched very very important topics would it be for nanomedicine would it be for Horizon Europe or, or whether for the ETPN indeed uh, we have five minutes for questions right now if you wish and uh, you will be amazed that we already have one of our keynote speaker <laughs> that want to ask you a question, which is Patrick Bamauf. So I'm looking for Patrick to give him the mic. And the others, you can raise your hand or uh, write, your, write your question down if you wish. So now, uh, dear Patrick, you can unmute and you can uh, ask your question to it. Okay, so thank you. Can you hear me? Loudly. Yes, yes. Yeah, perfect. So thanks, Ruth, for this uh, really nice overview. And I wanted to raise a point on... Uh, the um, expectations and also the nanomedicine um, going now into the market. Currently, we have uh, maybe on patrol, but it seems for the vaccine field, we will have uh, several uh, different, uh, for example, also messenger RNA-based nanomedicines in the market maybe next year. And uh, this will then uh, have also a big impact because this will not be for a few people, uh, maybe thousands that have this a, uh, an ATT uh, with some patro, but it will be on billions uh, that uh, will be exposed to this kind of nanomedicines. And we are doing this on a very fast pace. And um, you, you know, uh, doing production upscaling and stuff like this. Um, I think we are in dire need of uh, such things that uh, you are doing here. And that should be used in your favor. Thank you very much for this comment. I, I totally agree. And uh, uh, this is something we also mentioned uh, in, the, in the paper that uh, Mathieu will uh, present and that we wrote in the Journal of Control release where we li really uh, mentioned that uh, nanomedicine is on the way up from uh, uh, it's it's uh, really um, 
going closer to the market with uh, several really important impacts. Thanks a lot for your question, Patrick. I have another question for Lorena Dieguez, which is our dear uh, working group leader for medical devices at the ETPN. And Lorena is asking, do we know already when to expect the first release of the work program for 2021? Ruth, do you have any element of answer? Uh, I'm trying to find out. I, I, I mean, one of the problems is still, um, uh, one of the problems is still that the, the budget is not finalized. So um, they are working with the program as if the budget was, <laughs> uh, if they knew that the budget will come. But uh, first of all, the, the budget has to be, um, has to be finalized. Um, during the R&D days, they said that they expect the publication of the calls start during summer 2021, maybe already in March. But uh, it really, um, I think they don't really know. The commission doesn't really know because they don't have the, the political uh, finalization of the whole program. We have a prediction by our dear Nicola Goose, the ex, the former general secretary of the ETPN, uh, commenting that the war program should be officially released in April 2021. Uh, well, wait and see. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, my impression is that we had some fear of a few months ago that we have a blank year. And it seems that this fear is disappearing, that we won't have a, a year without codes. Not, not, a to not a whole year, I think, no, because uh, that was also what they said. Uh, um, maybe in March, but at least during summer. And April is in between there. So we are quite, um, <laughs> we, we agreed together. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you again, Ruth. If we have uh, more questions at the end of this session, indeed, uh, I will ask you to, to enter them. And thank you for this very nice introduction talk, very broad and strategical. Uh, so now I will leave the floor to Mathieu Germain. Uh, so Mathieu, you are still here. You can start your video, please, and your sound. And uh, well, Mathieu is the CEO of Curadigm. And uh, for those who don't know Curadigm, it's a very innovative uh, SME in the nanomedicine field, proposing a technology of nanopriming of the body through uh, nanotechnology uh, to uh, enhance the efficiency or lower the potential toxicity of, uh, of uh, payloads. And um, so Mathieu, uh, you will talk us, you will, you will describe a little bit one of the greatest achievement, uh, recent achievement of the ETPN, which is our latest uh, position paper. Uh, it was a long journey to, to write it together. I had the chance to be co-author of this uh, um, article that you have coordinated. Thank you for that. And uh, yes, I mean, it's uh, really the, the great occasion today to share with our members and outside the community of the ETPN all the great results uh, and the great uh, vision uh, which are included in the article. So now, uh, Mathieu, thank you for your talk and the room is yours. Thanks, Alexandre, for this nice introduction and thanks for the organization of uh, this virtual uh, ETPN. That's really great uh, to be there. Uh, so I will try to share my screen. Let me know if it's okay. I will go to the first slide. Better. Uh -huh. Is it okay? Can you see it? Uh... Yes, perfect. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, we wrote this paper together uh, through uh, ATP and um, members um, because we start uh, with a um, constatation uh, that there is a, a question uh, which came up the most and more and more frequently these last years, uh, as explained by by Ruth, there is some doubt, uh, doubt about uh, achievement of nanomedicine. Is it still a promise or is is it becoming a reality? Uh, where do we stand with nanomedicine? Uh, and we frequently see the, so this um, picture, the uh, hype cycle of uh, nanomedicine expectation. So, and with the question, where do we stand with nanomedicine? Are we just after the peak uh, of expectation? Are we in the photo of through the delusion? Uh, do we come back to this plateau of productivity or are we in the valley of death and there is nothing to expect from nanomedicine? Um, and there is 
some editorial, some paper which has been published uh, and feeding this, uh, this fact. And one of the most famous ones was the one written by uh, Keenan Park on the Journal of Control release last year, uh, uh, explaining that uh, nanomedicine uh, still promises, in fact, from his vision, uh, um, giving some fact about, uh, to explain his vision, uh, especially uh, the fact that uh, the National Cancer Institute uh, announced that it stopped the funding of this Center of Cancer and Technology Excellence Center, uh, with the reason that the technology is now uh, enough mature to compete, uh, compete with uh, other technology and other te uh, cancer research. <coughs> even if there is a high number of publication, uh, I mean, from his vision at the end of his paper, it's a, always the same conclusion that there is great potential with nanomedicine, but not real achievement. At least uh, his vision has a merit to open the debate uh, um, to discuss what has been done uh, with nanomedicine. Uh, I don't know if some of you had the opportunity to uh, uh, to be present during the uh, last year control release society meeting. There was this debate between Keenan Park and Patrick Coover. It was very interesting. Uh, uh, I had uh, a chance to be there and it was really nice, uh, this discussion. There is pro and cons from both sides. Uh, but yeah, this debate was uh, really good. So there will be no fight today about uh, uh, nanomedicine achievement. Why? Because personally, I think uh, nanomedicine makes a difference. And <laughs> I assume that in ATPN, everybody will agree with this point. Uh, and there is also some uh, paper uh, which has been published to answer Kinan Park uh, editorial uh, and to explain why nanomedicine makes a difference. Typically, we can uh, um, cite uh, Professor Grodinsky uh, um, quotation about um, the achievement of the Center of Cancer uh, Research Center, which, okay, has produced a large number of nanomedicine publication, but also uh, allows the creation of more than 100 startup companies and uh, allows the entering clinical trial in the US of more than 30 uh, products. So really, there is achievement uh, made by nanomedicine. But to start, this uh, the writing of this article, uh, we start with the idea that we, we, we make a state of the art of what has been done by nanomedicine, uh, what are the next uh, product which will make a difference and what is needed. So the idea is really to, to be true about what we can do uh, with nanomedicine as mentioned Kinan Park uh, on his uh, uh, citation that I just put here. Uh, really, we have to be true, to be honest uh, about what we can do with nanomedicine. So to give our vision, uh, a TPN vision, we wrote this article, uh, which has been recently published uh, in a um, journal of control reason, which made the, the, the cover of, uh, um, of this journal. So uh, we were quite happy of this. Uh, and you see the, the different name of people that, that have been involved uh, in, the, in the writing of this far article uh, in ETPN. <clears throat> so really the idea is to, to give the vision a state of the art uh, uh, of what has been done today with nanomedicine, recent product uh, uh, approved, uh, what are the next one and what is needed to ensure a good development <coughs> of nanomedicine uh, product. So if we have a look on uh, the number of approved formulation based on nanomedicine, there is more than 50 product approved. And you see it start uh, in the uh, 90s with the approval of the first one, I mean, the Doxyl, Lombisome, and so on. And after there is a continuous progression in the number uh, of approved products uh, in nanomedicine. And it's covering different indication. It's in mainly in oncology, in infection, uh, so in imaging. Um, and uh, it's based on lipid, there is high number of liposome, of course, uh, also iron oxide nanoparticle are um, very present due to their uh, specific properties. So we could ask where, where is the, the, the problem? I mean, there is a, uh, some products which has make it, but uh, after what happened? I think we, 
it was a revolution in the 19th uh, uh, nanomedicine field. So there was a lot of expectation which has been put uh, in nanomedicine, maybe too high the expectation. And we uh, anticipated a little bit too much uh, uh, the promises which can be delivered through nanomedicine. So uh, the community, nanomedicine community, uh, wait a lot, but it was too long uh, to deliver these promises. Uh, and maybe some people lost their patience and start to think maybe it's not becoming a, a, a reality. But I mean, to be clear, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, so to ensure delivery of these promises, uh, the generation of uh, new uh, technology in nanomedicine, we have to, to benefit of years of nanotechnology development through material innovation in polymer, uh, lipid science, uh, and the synthesis approach. Uh, I mean, we uh, saw the apparition of microfluidic uh, and so on to produce this nanomedicine uh, and Nanomedicine is not working alone. We have to combine it with other technology, physics, uh, robotics, and so on uh, to uh, deliver efficiently the, these promises. So at the end, uh, I think now it's becoming a reality and it's, it's clearly visible with the, the last product which uh, 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 has been approved very recently. And I just want to give you some example uh, of this product. The first one is uh, uh, Vixeo, uh, which has been developed by uh, Kelator. This uh, Vixeo, it's a lipid-based nanoparticle with uh, two drugs encapsulated inside uh, with the optimized ratio between the uh, concentration of this uh, uh, drug encapsulated. It has been approved three years ago in the treatment of uh, acute um, yeah, uh, myeloid leukemia. And really for me, it's uh, the next generation of drug delivery. Uh, it started with doxyl, encapsulation of doxorubicin, and now you have two drugs with a synergic ratio inside. So you can easily imagine that uh, we can reproduce uh, um, this nanomedicine with over drug to target over indication and, and to bring new solution for, for, for the patient clearly. Another good example uh, is Ampatro. Uh, <clears throat> Ampatro was the first lipid-based nano, um, nano formulation uh, encapsulating silencing RNA, which has been approved two years ago in the uh, treatment of transteritin uh, amyloidosis. And really, uh, it solved a lot of issue um, of nucleic acid based therapy. I mean, uh, if you want to deliver efficiently uh, nucleic acid, you know that uh, you will face some issue in terms of biodistribution, degradation of this nucleic acid. So you need encapsulation and nanomedicine will bring a solution to overcome uh, this issue. And uh, as Vixeo for small molecule on Patro uh, open really bright perspective for uh, the delivery of nucleic acid based uh, therapy. And we can see that also and beta XR3 developed by nanobiotics, uh, which is a, an aftium oxide nanoparticle dedicated to be intratumorally administered to locally enhance uh, energy dose deposition within the tumor cell. So you will increase uh, uh, the dose of radiotherapy within the tumor and not adding uh, um, side effects on the surrounding tissue. And really here, uh, the nanoparticle is becoming the, um, the API uh, by itself. There is no more anything encapsulated inside. It's really becoming the uh, principal active ingredient. Uh, also for imaging, uh, we can sit uh, mag trace for endomag, which are uh, iron oxide um, magnetic nanoparticles uh, dedicated to be uh, deposited during mastectomy uh, to uh, localize lymph node and to perform biopsy of uh, uh, cancer cell inside. So really uh, combined uh, to magnetic, lo magnetic localization system, uh, you, it will bring more accurate diagnostic and it will avoid the use of radioactive tracers. So you really bring something new also in the field of imaging uh, with this uh, technology. So really, if we have a look at nanomedicine, <clears throat> there is a clear evolution uh, uh, in the field. I mean, there was the first uh, uh, drug delivery system uh, with evolution of this system as we saw with Vixeo uh, and now we benefit uh, 
uh, of other technologies such as physics uh, to bring new solution based on a nano object where it becomes the active principal ingredient clearly. So who's next now? I mean, uh, if you just listen to me, uh, you've got a pretty good idea of what are the next uh, generation with uh, the different product we describe uh, open really uh, bright perspective so we can uh, um, think that uh, it will bring a lot of new, new product in the field. Uh, writing this paper, we had a look on the, what was going ongoing uh, in terms of clinical trials uh, involved in nanomedicine. So we perform a, a survey, uh, including keywords such as liposome, nanomedicine, nanoparticule, and so on. And we identify more than 400 clinical trials um, for therapy and diagnostic uh, involving nanomedicine. <clears throat> and this number is quite decreasing because from the last two years, there were more than um, 247 new clinical trials which were initiated uh, in the field. And uh, if we classify this uh, ongoing clinical trial regarding the nature of the nanoparticles, mainly it's liposome based. Uh, if we are talking about cancer-related trials or unrelated, in both cases, it's liposome based. But more and more, uh, there is new uh, kind, new nature of nanoparticle which is uh, involved in this clinical trial. Uh, and it's mainly focused in cancer, as you saw. Why? Because we, we just saw it, in fact, with the um, product which treats uh, approval. Uh, it opened perspective in terms of diagnostic, in terms of treatment during chemotherapy or in association with other technologies such as physics during radiotherapy. So yeah, it's bring a lot in oncology, sure, but also in over indication. If we have a look on the evolution of this clinical trial uh, per indication uh, on the last years, uh, we see that, okay, it's uh, mainly focused in oncology still, but it's decreasing uh, in terms of percentage uh, because nanoparticle has specific properties that could solve uh, uh, issue in other indication. I mean, if we are talking about delivery within the nervous sun, um, central system, uh, <clears throat> nanoparticles are able to cross a blood brain barrier and deliver more efficiently um, a therapeutic agent within the brain, typically. In genetic disease, uh, it's improving. We see that uh, uh, lipid based nanoparticles uh, are efficient drug delivery system for nucleic acid based therapeutics, uh, not only in oncology. I mean, if we are talking about COVID disease, uh, uh, if I remember well, there, are, there was more when we perform, write this paper, there was at least three uh, clinical trials initiated with uh, this product. And I think clearly there is more now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and also. Um, um, vaccine, rare disease treatment, um, this lipid nanoparticle uh, brings a lot uh, uh, to, to this treatment. So clearly there is an evolution uh, in the repartition of indication which can be uh, treated using uh, nanomedicine. <clears throat> and why? Because nanomedicine could be seen uh, uh, as a platform uh, with different element uh, that can be combined uh, um, in different way uh, uh, to optimize uh, the nanoparticle and to adapt it to the need uh, um, of the, the, the disease you want to treat. Uh, I mean, you can tune surface properties, the size, core composition, uh, uh, encapsulate different, and you know it uh, perfectly. And at the end, I don't want to uh, make some advertisement for uh, Curalang, but um, to the extremity, you can uh, dissociate the function into object. Uh, this is what we are doing uh, in, uh, in Curadime. We try to benefit of um, the advantages bring by a nanoparticle which is able uh, to uh, uh, deal with the bioability uh, of the secondly administered therapeutic agents. Really, the idea is to dissociate the function in two separate um, nano object. So at the end, we see that nanomedicine is not anymore focused only in oncology. Uh, it opened new perspective in also over indication. It's becoming reality in this over indication also. And 
it cannot be seen anymore uh, uh, as a single technology. It's working cross-sectorial and cross-technological uh, solution uh, um, to bring the solution to the patient. I mean, uh, it can be used also in uh, uh, nanosensors, uh, um, combined with a physical, so we can also set the um, gold nanoparticle for local physics treatment and so on and so on. So, I mean, at the end, uh, why should we continue to support nanomedicine? Because it seems if we are uh, comparing uh, um, the total success rate of nanomedicine in oncology uh, with the one of conventional drug, we are clearly better uh, uh, for nanomedicine. But it's not the case outside in oncology. Uh, uh, the use of nanomedicine uh, um, could be really improved outside uh, of, uh, of oncology. Uh, why? Because I think there is some gap uh, in the translation of nanomedicine into the clinic. Uh, it's not so easy uh, to uh, transfer an innovative idea uh, to a, a real product. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, of obstacle to uh, overcome uh, to do this. So we need to uh, uh, ensure um, education in business management, uh, especially if we are talking uh, about academia, transferring a project into a, a company, um, that's a, a big step. Uh, also, characterization of nanomedicine, uh, it's not uh, an easy task. The scale up, GFME ma manufacturing is also complex and the regulatory framework uh, is fragmented and need to be adapted to uh, the need of nanomedicine, clearly. So, uh, I think I will be quite fast on this, uh, uh, on this topic because uh, uh, you know what is ETPN, what is our mission and uh, Ruth already explained and it will be explained a little bit more uh, uh, during uh, ETPN virtual meetings. Uh, but really the idea is to support the system of nanomedicine in Europe and to bring all the different uh, stakeholders uh, together uh, to build a strategy to support uh, nanomedicine. So just to mention uh, that, yeah, nanomedicine published all these years, uh, um, strategic and innovation research agenda, white paper and so on. These paper are typically also ready to support uh, nanomedicine in Europe. Uh, and in collaboration with the European Commission. And there is different tool uh, made by, um, by ETPN to support uh, this development of nanomedicine. And really, I wanted to mention uh, Translation Lab Hub uh, to transform innovative project to a solution for the patient using uh, three different uh, uh, main tools uh, within this translational hub. The first one is a tab, um, translation advisory board, which is a, um, <clears throat> a free for far for charge uh, service uh, for selected project um, to really support monitoring uh, this project and uh, uh, allow um, creation of a, a product from an innovative uh, ID, really within the ID um, to support health tech revolution in Europe uh, by accelerating innovation. Uh, so to support <laughs> the, to, the innovative ID to cross the valley of death, let's say, uh, by providing this monitoring, uh, support for fundraising, establishing network uh, um, for the uh, innovators. And there is a proven value of this, uh, of this tab because it supported uh, already more than 100 projects. Uh, uh, there was four startups created uh, and support uh, uh, fundraising of this uh, uh, different company. Um, also UNCL, uh, Ruth uh, already mentioned it, but uh, uh, it's really a, a great organization to support uh, the characterization of nanomedicine. So until last year, it was free of charge. Uh, it may evolve uh, quite soon, but it was really a nice uh, um, support um, center uh, to, to, to support innovation in, um, in nanomedicine and also to develop um, analytical method, uh, standard operating procedure uh, to perform this characterization. 
I mean, here you see the different uh, entities which are involved uh, in this network. And uh, the objective really of UNCL uh, to perform and standard, standardize uh, preclinical characterization of nanomaterials uh, through this standard operating procedure and to accelerate the translation of innovative product um, in the field. Uh, some achievement of UNCL it has supported until this creation more than uh, 30 nanomedicine products and created more than 30 standard operating procedures uh, shared with the community. Also in HPN, there is a GMP scale up pilot line to, uh, uh, which has been created uh, to support the development from milliliter to liter uh, active nanomaterials uh, and to ensure the scale up uh, uh, for the delivery of clinical batches. Uh, the regulatory framework of nanomedicine. Uh, officially, until now, this is the same framework as for conventional drug. I mean, we have to ensure, of course, the safety, efficacy, and the quality uh, of this drug, but there is some challenge to overcome with nanomedicine. I mean, uh, their characterization, physical chemical characterization are quite specific regarding their properties. Uh, if we're talking about the size, polydispersity is very important, their surface property, it's quite challenging to characterize the surface of some nanoparticle. Um, also the drug loading and release, especially in uh, biological media, is quite complex. Sometimes there's a lot of interaction to overcome to uh, ensure an efficient characterization. So it's highly challenging to perform uh, uh, this characterization. So we need uh, uh, support to perform this development of relevant uh, um, procedure for this uh, characterization. This is the work of UNCL and uh, um, the US and CL with their cascade essay, all the protocol and SOAPs they are developing in collaboration with other uh, um, consortiums such as Refine, uh, Safe Nanomaterials and uh, all this within the ID to bring an harmonized international regulatory framework for nanomedicine by uh, constructing this network with interaction between uh, uh, NCL organization, Metrology Institute, uh, and also uh, regulatory bodies. This is really the ID. And it's supported by uh, ETPN. Uh, we are actively uh, supporting different uh, um, uh, in different uh, initiatives, such as the one from EMA, which uh, bring uh, its uh, regulatory science to 2025 with five different pillars. And ETPN is supportive, um, the pillar regarding innovation in regulatory science. ETPN is supporting uh, potential new funding of UNCN, if possible, and other initiative, uh, which has been mentioned by Root, because at the end also, nanomedicine cannot be uh, seen as a single technology uh, if we want to uh, support its development. All the new initiatives are, are, are not focused anymore on a single technology. We have to uh, work um, in a collaborative approach. And um, there is an in, in, in initiative from ETPN to ensure uh, this collaborative approach. We can see the Nobel, it will be described later on clearly, but just to mention, it's coordinated by uh, ETPN uh, with the funding of European uh, uh, Commission. And the idea is to build an ecosystem to support the development of health tech community in Europe uh, by ensuring uh, um, communication between the stakeholder uh, to define a strategy and to accelerate innovation uh, between different uh, uh, health tech. Uh, to really change uh, and optimize the continuum of care uh, for the patient, uh, clearly. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to remove the uh, um, animation. Uh, this is a mapping of all the different uh, uh, organizations involved uh, in this consortium. Uh, so yes, just to, to conclude now, uh, to answer this question, was none of the medicine over promoted few years ago? The answer for me is yes, but, the promises are now becoming a reality for the patient. We are delivery, uh, delivering uh, therapies to treat patients. So we are clearly turning nanomedicine from academia development to a proven clinical value. And I think it's clearly not over because um, <clears throat> 
therapeutics are more and more costly and uh, healthcare systems cannot offer such cost of treatment and clearly nanomedicine could bring innovative solution uh, for mass treatment uh, uh, of patient clearly uh, but is it enough mature no we need to support nanomedicine translation uh, by putting collaboration between the, uh, communication between the stakeholders uh, ensuring uh, uh, a good environment with the instrument to support this translation, the formation of young researcher and work in a collaborative approach with other uh, FTEC um, system, uh, really to bring new solution all for the benefit uh, of the patient. So yeah, it was uh, the message we want to bring uh, within this paper, uh, really to give a vision of nanomedicine and what is needed still to ensure the development of this nanomedicine. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, um, Mathieu. That was excellent. As usual. Uh, a few comments. Oh. And uh, if you have questions, you can raise your hand or put the question in a written form right now. First comment is that, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, this uh, paper in Journal of Control Release is free of charge for download. It's open source. You can download it, uh, full version with all the graphics, etc. Mm. So please go ahead. Uh, please read it. And uh, we are super happy to, to share it with you. That's I put it also on the on our website, uh, Alex, to mention in the work group, um, nanotherapeutics and delivery, you can find it inside. Exactly, because I don't even know if I mentioned that you are the group leader of the ETPN working group on nanotherapeutics. Oh, and <laughs> so, um, so thanks for the presentation. Um, lots of initiatives that you've described will be, uh, will be uh, let's say, developed and presenting during ETPN 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, please stay until the end for the workshop tomorrow afternoon that we organize with New Deal, with Be Smart, uh, with Smart for Fabry and with Cupido, which are, let's say, sister H2020 projects uh, doing some very fancy drug delivery. And this workshop is uh, translational issues in nanomedicine. And we will speak about that. We we'll speak about GMP manufacturing, large scale manufacturing. We'll speak about all the classical uh, pitfalls uh, to develop uh, such complex pro products that are nanomedicine products. Uh, thanks a lot, Mathieu. That was excellent. I have first a comment. Welcome. The comment is uh, it's not just about the potency, but with nanoparticles, uh, nanoparticles one can realize when we can get a much larger cargo loading capacity. And when it comes to gene therapy, one cannot deny this, that this is a unique uh, advantage indeed mm -hmm. of uh, nanocarriers. Uh, well, that, that's perfectly clear. Now we have another question of uh, our very active keynote speaker, Patrick. So Patrick, I leave you the mic now. I think you can, oh, sorry. Yes, Patrick, you, you can speak if you want now. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm not sure to you um, um, uh, give uh, the video now or... Excuse me? Patrick? I, I'm, I'm currently not sure what, what I have to do. <laughs> uh, no, I, I thought you, you had a question because uh, you, you were some kind of raising your hand in the, in the pool of uh, people. But if it's not the case, it's a mistake from my part. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. No, no, no problem. Um, so your, your keynote is coming, but it's not right now. Uh, are there any other questions at this stage or we can move on to the next uh, speaker? I think it's, uh, we can move on. So once again, Mathieu, thanks a lot. And please go and uh, download this, uh, this article. We'll be happy to discuss it um, anytime with you and not only during the working group meeting this afternoon. Thanks a lot, Mathieu. Thanks, Alexandre. <laughs> now we move to the next speaker, which is uh, Klaus-Michel Veltring. Uh, you all know Klaus, I guess, but for uh, the, the rare people that doesn't know Klaus, uh, Klaus uh, used to be a part of the Expo for long years of the ETPN, one of the pioneers uh, in, uh, of the ETPN. He used to be notably in charge of the advisory group for ethics and social acceptance. Uh, Klaus uh, has a PhD in molecular biology. He is the head of Bioanalytic Münster, which is the cluster for, to, to develop nanomedicine in the Münster region in Germany. He's a fantastic specialist of nanomedicine, but on top of that, he's a great partner within the Nobel project that I have the chance to coordinate. And so, as you saw, Nobel is basically trying to build an ecosystem exactly like we did for nanomedicine, but for all key enabling technologies for health in Europe. 
And um, now for the, the minutes uh, that are coming, um, Klaus will talk about a very important strategic move that we are preparing, a very important alliance for the future of uh, nanomedicine in synergy with the other health technologies. This alliance is, to, is called the Ester Alliance, or Health Tech for You, you will see. And uh, it's my great pleasure to, today to leave the floor to, uh, to close because you will see this is how Nobel's heritage will continue to give um, the ETPN, notably, a broader voice in Europe. So uh, thanks a lot, Klaus, and the floor is yours. Uh, well, Alexander, <clears throat> thanks a lot uh, for giving me this opportunity to give a little bit of the history and also uh, how ETPN will open up its new chapter of uh, development, basically. And uh, therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to work a little bit on the history of, of how things uh, are happening here and uh, have happened in the past. So you can see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, <clears throat> so there have been some mentions about Esther. Actually, Esther stands for, as you can see up here, Emerging Smart Technologies for Healthcare. And it was an initiative which started about five years ago. <clears throat> and I would like to give you a little bit of the big background why this was uh, launched. And um, the, one of the reasons was that at that time, it was clear that medicine is going through a transition from reactive and medicine to more preventive and integrated healthcare. And that, um, so there was an integration of diagnostic and treatments. It was more outcome-based and prevention became a, a big topic. And that was the time when this P4 medicine uh, term was uh, coined, which is personalized, predictive, preventive, and participatory. So medicine was changing. And as has been shown by uh, <clears throat> Wood already, the reason is that disruptive technologies revolutionize healthcare. It's not just biology-driven revolutions like these new biomarkers mentioned by uh, Wood, but also nanomedicine had a big impact, as we just saw, uh, having new options for diagnostic and therapies. But also stem cells became very important in 3D printing of biomaterials, which gave a big push to regenerative medicine. And so along that, of course, all these technology-driven evolutions, as mentioned by Root, from sensors, <clears throat> big data, machine learning, apps, and, and so on. So there is a lot of things going on. And uh, it became clear that more and more these technologies have to converge with each other, in, at least uh, in part, so uh, that uh, the new developments go for more uh, solutions than just technology solutions uh, of, or solutions of a single technology. So it became clear, clear that the new uh, products were across technology, like this retina prosthesis system is uh, including advanced materials, photonics, ICT, biotechnology, and so on. So cross-technology was a new uh, <clears throat> trend, I would say. But since this is done by different industries, it's also a different, it's, it's a cross-industry development. So where pharma, biotech, medical devices have to work more with each other. I mean, the biggest or the most famous uh, example is uh, companion diagnostics for new drugs coming on the market. But also, as we have seen in the last years, more and more IT companies, Apple is seen here, or, or Google, or Amazon, um, discovered healthcare as a, new, as a new field where they could go in. And since all these different, all these industries are very different, it also means we have different cross business models. <clears throat> as you know, Medtech and, and Pharma have different models, but now the IT um, companies coming in are even more different. Different. So <clears throat> there are needs for cross business models. So the challenge basically was that we have this, let's say, lake of technologies converge with digitization, where these different industries have to tap into to get their new products uh, <clears throat> developed, but they also have to relate with each other to make these new products for patient clinics, insurances, and so on. So, uh, <clears throat> of course, in between, we have the regulatory ecosystem, which also have to cope with this uh, kind of uh, uh, developments. So that was the reason why about five years ago, Christos Tokamanis uh, from uh, the head of unit of uh, research, innovation, and industrial technologies asked um, Medtech Europe and ETPN 
to think about a concept, how to cope with these different uh, challenges. And as you can see here in the middle, <coughs> the core group was basically made up of uh, ATPN members and Metal Europe. So the former chairman, Patrick Boisseau and Francois Chabi from CA, Paul Galvin from Tyndall and Fuyo Grammatica from Dominocchi and myself were the people who um, tried to bring in the experience we had from the ETPN in the past 10 years, how to how to make concepts, how research and, and industry and the ecosystem can be developed in a sense that really products come to the market which really uh, <clears throat> address medical needs. And from uh, Medtech Europe, uh, Serge Berlusconi, the CEO and two other people were involved. But we were not alone thinking about this concept, but also different EC units were involved. And on the right side, you can see that different industry people and representatives were involved as advisors. <clears throat> so the idea was to cope, to make an open, flexible, integrated platform, which le is led by industry, but it includes all the stakeholders you need. So procurers, patients, regulators, technology providers, and so on. Uh, and the idea was that you need all these stakeholders to improve coordination along the whole value chain from R&D to market access. And <clears throat> by doing this, you could contribute to the existing programs, which these uh, with priorities, which really fit to the needs and really, really fit to the, to the market uh, you can actually uh, bring products to. So we published uh, this famous Astor uh, paper endorsed by, by Medtech Europe, which was basically the, in, the, the, the <clears throat> the initiation of the new development. And the question here was, how do we implement this complex holistic uh, concept, which involves all the stakeholders? How do you bring them to work to, uh, together? <clears throat> to have this kind of vision, which actually is providing integrated, innovative and smart healthcare solutions for European patients. <clears throat> um, and the first or one of the one of the important steps was how can you manage to bring the different university uh, the different industries to the table and here <coughs> uh, the development was that the that the, um, that the european commission invited these five um, uh, industry associations around the table to think about a common public-private partnership, which is now called Health Innovation, and I think a future name is Vita or something. But anyway, it was the first time that COSIA representing Imazine, FPA representing Pharma, Europa Bio representing Biotech, Medtech Europe representing Medical Technology, and Vaccines Europe, the vaccine industry, were sitting around the table to think about a common approaches uh, <clears throat> which pushes the boundaries of free competitive space. So actually really trying to, to, to bring together across pharma, biologic, medtech and health, I mean, to, to bring together the expertise so that you can create cross-sector innovations and then also working together, strengthen the translational research ecosystem in Europe. Now, well, how they want to achieve this was, of course, through uh, integration of technologies and how products and services, also clinical communities, but also business models. So all the points I have mentioned before. <clears throat> so that was a, a big step and it's still in, 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 the, in, in, in the work. If you want to know more about the evolution of this partnership, you can go to this, to this website where they also have some, some case studies and examples. And this is the tentative uh, uh, timeline uh, of this um, evolution of this public-private partnership. So you will see that uh, if everything works out, the, they start to launch first calls in, let's say, at the end of 2021. So this public-private partnership is one part of this ESTO concept, which demanded a more um, trans-sector or cross-sector collaboration of the different healthcare industries to be involved. Now, question is what happens to the other stakeholders, which you also need to have this, uh, the, the uh, platform filled with all the stakeholders. And here we were lucky enough that we, which is, we is in this case, the ETPN, became, uh, got approved this uh, project, which has been already mentioned, which is called Nobel, <clears throat> which actually is taking care of a unique ecosystem to make health revolution happen in Europe. So um, these are the core partners. And as you can see, again, ETPN nanomedicine is uh, not only the core part, one of the core partners, but it's also the coordinator of this, of this project. 
and we have some different different uh, <clears throat> technology and clinical parts. Tinder, represented by Paul Gavin and Don Lucky by Fuyu, you will find here again. So we had these partners, but more importantly, even was that we also had the technology uh, organizations in Europe as associated partners. In this case, seven ranging from photonics and electronics to, uh, <clears throat> to robotics, even textiles and uh, big data. So um, <clears throat> we uh, had a, a work package, which I was happening, which I was the leader of, when we asked the, these uh, associated partners, uh, what is your contribution, what is the contribution of your technology to medical areas in the next five to six years? And we came up with a major roadmap. And this is just one example where we define potential areas for cross-cutting uh, uh, approaches, then defined the, the specific uh, technical uh, challenges, looked what kind of technologies need to be involved to meet these challenges, and then also ask about the timelines. And as you can see, <clears throat> here we have, uh, for example, timelines for advanced materials and photonics. So that was a huge effort, but it laid the basis <clears throat> for defining how technologies actually influence the continuum of care. That was something which was mentioned already before. So this is our, like, like the, the regular journey of, of a patient which starts with uh, healthy, uh, healthy status and then gets diagnosed a, a disease. You go to therapy, which might be a medication or hospitalization. And then if you're lucky, uh, you, go, you become healthy again. Or if you're not so lucky, you have a chronic therapy. Now, <clears throat> with the help of the associated uh, technology organizations, we could show and visualize that the, um, that the well-being and pre-acute phase is extended because we now, due to all these different technologies I mentioned in the beginning, like gene therapy or gene editing or, or, or regenerative medicine, <clears throat> we can not only make predictions of, of possible diseases, but we also can maybe prevent the outbreak of some of the diseases. And even if there is something like a genetic disease, which might come up after five or 10 years, we have the monitoring devices to really watch when things are happening. So the, 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 the early phase becomes much more important due to these different technologies, but also the, pre -acute, the acute phase becomes shorter and more precise because we have like uh, surgery robotics, we have all the information from the first uh, pre-acute phase, which goes into, into this uh, therapy. And then <clears throat> uh, we can personalize the diagnostic and we can precise the medication and surgery. Now, uh, after that, uh, the uh, post-acute phase is improved because now we have, let's say, as examples, robots or gamification to motivate, to motivate, to motivate, no, to motivate uh, patients to stick to their um, therapy, to have their rehabilitation program and so on. So things are more effective. And that is also uh, happening for the, uh, for the home care phase, which is also an area where a lot of these technology uh, are involved think about variable smart homes and all these kind of things. So smart textiles, photonics, nanoelectronics, and these come together to improve the condition and quality of life in, in this area of the patient journey. So you see in this case, we can even now address the areas of a continuum of integrated care where all these technologies play a role, which for example, is a good indication for SMEs where that technology might play a role in, in, in this area. So it, was, it became clear that we need an inclusion of key enabling to uh, technologies um, because they are the basis for digitization uh, of healthcare, prevention or cure of disease, even for personalization, precision and everything else I mentioned. So um, <clears throat> then of course, um, it, to do this, it needs a more structural exchange of information dialogue so that uh, we get a feeling of the different uh, timelines and uh, possible connectivities of these different technologies, which certainly is a big challenge. If you think that, for example, photonics might be a very fast development, but 3D printing or biomaterials might be uh, taking you longer. So you have to synchronize the speed of development of these different technologies. So <clears throat> it became clear that um, all technology development should work together to join 
uh, and propose uh, R&D priorities, for example, of the PPP Health Innovation, but also for the health cluster in Horizon Europe, which was mentioned before uh, by Ruth. <clears throat> and I think uh, it very nicely connects to what Ruth said in the beginning, that this different thinking of having cross-tech uh, solutions for health uh, needs is really the new thinking and that's why a single technology cannot uh, make a contribution by itself. It needs this cross approach. So um, <clears throat> the next step building on our collaboration with the associated uh, European technology platforms, we were thinking about how to how to sustain this uh, this um, this development. And uh, together with them, we uh, developed a, a memorandum of understanding <clears throat> Uh, defining more uh, the single uh, USP, which basically is that we, with these European technology platforms, which actually embrace not only academics, but they also embrace uh, hospitals, uh, SMEs, research organizations, research and technology organizations, and even clinicians. So it, it basically covers the whole ecosystem or the rest of the ecosystem, which was defined by uh, Esther uh, besides the industry ecosystem. So um, I think together we were, <coughs> we are able to deliver solutions for medtech uh, solution for medtech needs. Now, uh, we are very happy that this MOU has already been signed by five of the eight ETOs. Um, <clears throat> the other three are coming up. We know it's, it's more a technical thing with their board of directors. So the next step then, of course, will be strategic actions toward the PPP Health and Horizon Europe Health Cluster and other, other programs where we think we can provide cross-technology approaches. So um, <clears throat> our offer is to promote and foster cross technology developments for medical applications, which are regulatory, which are regularly updated by the meta roadmap um, from these different associations. And then <clears throat> uh, we can actually effectively create and promote integrated solutions along the continuum of care with these uh, partners, uh, which we brought together. So as you can see, <clears throat> um, the ETPN basically has evolved and, and has driven this, uh, this development uh, to this point we are seeing now with the PPP Health. And uh, honestly, um, as you might know, our former chairman Patrick Boisseau now is uh, employed by Medtech Europe and is driving this PPP Health from a Medtech uh, Europe's point of view, uh, together with Francoise and Charbit. So uh, even there, ETPN on the industry side is very active and um, through Nobel, ETPN was able to bring together these technology organizations from Europe and run table and signing the MOU. And I think this will be a very powerful instrument, uh, not only for the PPP uh, Health Innovation, but also for the cluster health and even other missions, which are numerous out there where uh, cross technology solutions are needed. And I'm very happy that this is um, kind of uh, the new chapter, which is opened up for ETPN because ETPN is a driver through the Nobel project of this whole uh, technology uh, development. And uh, therefore, uh, I think it's the next level of ETPN. And if you want to know more about the, the, the evolution of this, uh, go to the Nobel website at, the, uh, until, at least until the end of the year when, when the project ends so that you can see how we actually, or if we are successful in approaching the PPP has innovation in the EC and, and other programs and see how <clears throat> they uh, regard us as important, which I think they should, uh, but you never know. Uh, anyway, so I think um, the NAP chapter is open and I'm very happy to be part of it. And I thank for your attention and uh, that's it for the moment. Great. Uh, fantastic talk, Klaus. Uh, very clear. I'm so happy that uh, we could make it, that we could share with our dear partners, ETPN members today, this uh, great opportunity for ETPN uh, to, uh, to help the constitution, even not to, to drive this, uh, this synergy between all um, key te technology uh, for health in Europe. That's the first time it happens. It's totally in, uh, in synergy with uh, what the industry is making uh, happening, these uh, new synergies in the PPP. So that's a fantastic opportunity for us. Uh, thanks again, Klaus, for uh, having done it. It's not that simple to explain. It was very clear, crystal clear. Um,
Do we have any question at this stage? Of the, because we are a little bit late because because of the passion, you know. Uh, so if there are there are just very nice comments about your talk, Klaus, but no question at this stage. Uh, this is the future of ETPN. This is not the exclusive future of ETPN. We will continue to exist as a standalone organization also. But uh, this is a unique place, a one-stop shop for bringing solutions to this um, medical challenge to tackle in Eurasian Europe. So uh, we will have many, many occasions to talk about that. And by the way, Alexandre Superville will uh, give a bit uh, more details about the highlights and new results of the Nobel project in the session tomorrow dedicated to results of the uh, EU um, uh, projects in nanomedicine. So thanks again, Klaus. Now we will close this session with a very short talk, but a very positive one. You will see uh, some good news about our next annual event. And for this, I would like to call on stage uh, Peter Vick, uh, Peter from EMPA. Peter is uh, co-hosting and co-organizing the next DTPN event, which is Enemy 21. Peter, please um, take the mic, share your presentation. Yeah, dear Ruth, dear Alexander, dear colleagues, um, it's a great pleasure to have these five minutes to announce hopefully the post-COVID time uh, meeting. So it's a great pleasure for me uh, and an honor for me to be the next host uh, and chair of the NME 21 in St. Gallen. I will be supported by two co-chairs, uh, Professor Filipovic from the nearby hospital covering the clinical aspects and Professor Geiser coming from the University of St. Gallen mainly be active or very active in e-health area. So we have a nice combination of health-related nanotechnology, clinics and e-health activity in the eastern part of Switzerland between the Alps and the Lake of Constance. The program or the, the frame is actually very similar to previous um, Nanomedicine Europe events so that we have one day the General Assembly and then we would have um, two days symposium days with different session, keynotes, a poster session, and of course enough time to hopefully have face-to-face -face, uh, exchange and a stimulating environment. So the program is, is currently put together, together with the great help of Alexander and, and Ruth, and um, with the active um, promoting of the event of Alexander. We will keep you up now in a regular pace with the program, with the registration. And if you need some information, please um, have also a look on the, the landing page. And we are now filling up this step-by-step uh, -step, uh, in the next days, weeks, so that you are already updated what are the next step. So with that, um, I have said all what I want. I'm looking really forward to welcome you all next time in St. Gallen and wish us an exciting and stimulating cross-technology uh, conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, excellent. We look forward very much. We think cross and uh, we hope that it will uh, happen in a normal way, but you've done already a tremendous job in preparing, the, preparing this new event. It's a bit the, the new uh, opportunity after Braga to have this global event with all these uh, selected abstracts, uh, not for just the pitch me up session, but for really scientific sessions in parallel of the ETPN session. So I'm extremely excited and uh, thank you for that. So now we come to the end of this opening session. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, because they, they did a tremendous job and I will leave the floor to Ruth if you have some uh, closing comments. By the meantime, if someone has any question at this stage, you can ask it uh, with the Q&A tool of Zoom. Uh, so uh, Ruth, if you want to, uh, to say some words. Thank you, Alex, uh, and thank you to all the speakers. And I think we have uh, uh, set the scene for nanomedicine for the next years or how to how we can find our way in the new um, Horizon Europe program and in a new environment. Uh, and now I'm looking forward to a lot of interesting science and projects.
uh, and also, of course, uh, to the working group meetings. And I'm looking forward to the social event. Exactly. I have no clue how this will, <laughs> what will come, but uh, I hope we will have a uh, um, funny uh, virtual networking. That was the only session I could not record before. So let's wait and see what happens. <laughs> uh, thanks again for all the, to all the speakers.